Good. See you again. Likewise. All right, can the folks hear me? Oh, it sounds good. Files are in the container. OK, um, well, welcome back. Um, day two, how was, uh, how was day one for everyone? Good, eh, OK, so-so. Did you all get, um, were there a lot of um, open spaces on containers uh, and stuff like that, like people kind of uh, hearing what they want to hear and talking about what they want to talk about? Yes, no, maybe, so-so. OK. Well, um, if, if it was your first time to DevOps days, like just like in the afternoons, you can kind of, uh, like what we did yesterday, you can kind of talk about uh, topics that you're interested in and, and want to talk about. So um, you know, you can, you can do that today as well. So we'll do kind of the same style in the afternoon. So mornings, we have talks. It helps you like, think about stuff a little bit more. And then in the afternoons, you like, well, that's cool and all, but like, how do I actually implement Docker in my enterprise, or how do I actually do, uh, you know, Kubernetes mesos and things like that? And we get groups together. So, uh, just just a quick way to, you know, to kind of facilitate that. Um, quick show of hands. I, I know we did this yesterday, but kind of want to do it on a, a basis today as well. Uh, how many folks here uh, use Docker or know about Docker? All right, that's good. How about uh, how many folks use it in production? All right, a, a few. And how many folks kind of want to use it in production in like six months? All right, awesome. That gives us some uh, like a good segue to um, 
good good segue for Steve to actually you know know his audience a little bit as well. Uh, I need to do a couple of shout outs real quick. Uh, first, um, I'd like to do a shout out to Xenos. Uh, Xenos is the sponsor who's actually doing all the Wi-Fi stuff for us. So uh, if you guys, I think it's uh, at Xenos on Twitter. So if y'all if y'all tweet. Uh, the whole or this half of the room, it'd be cool for you all to tweet to Xenos and say, "Hey, thanks for the Wi-Fi at DevOps Days Austin." Uh, Xenos is uh, is based in Austin, Texas, and is a global leader in hybrid IT monitoring. Uh, trusted by whoa, 35,000 organizations worldwide. Um, and I can't read the rest of this because it's too small. You sound surprised. Uh, well, I was like, <laughs> I didn't realize it was. Uh, that's a lot of organizations. 35,000. That's that's a whole lot. That's really really cool. Uh, the other shout out I'd like to give to maybe uh, at this side of the room, uh, if you all use Twitter, a uh, quick shout out to Alien Vault, uh, who's also another silver sponsor. Uh, Alien Vault, uh, where is that? Uh, Alien Vault is uh, where uh, Lee and Ernest and uh, a lot of our organizer crew kind of work at, and they are they've simplified the way organizations detect and respond to today's ever evolving threat landscape. Uh, they have a lot of cool uh, software to be able to kind of detect you know, uh, attacks and like mi basically mitigate your attack surface. So check them out. All right, so with that, uh, I'm going to kick us off. Uh, we have Steve uh, today from um, Sparefoot. Uh, and I know, I know this talk uh, is really interesting to a lot of folks. Uh, in fact, um, at um, DockerCon, Sparefoot had a talk uh, where they kind of talked about, you know, how they're, uh, uh, how they've gone from like using Docker to actually using Docker in production. It was like super, super well received, uh, and it's like, I think, you know, we we all talk about unicorns, and I think Sparefoot is like a unicorn in the Docker space because it's one of the first companies that said, hey, we're all in on, on the Docker stuff, and we're gonna try and like, uh, you know, go go with Docker as it is and kind of go through the evolution of Docker over the past past couple of years. So with that, let's give a hand to Steve. All right, thanks. Um, so again, I'm Steve Woodruff, and I'm the Director of DevOps at Sparefoot here in Austin. And I've been working on uh, continuous integration and continuous deployment for many years. Uh, I was a developer at Motorola for you know, a long time before that. And I started out at IBM a long, long time ago doing system administration on the old R6000. So I've had my hands in a lot of different areas, which kind of makes it uh, really applicable to what I'm doing these days. Um, so just real quick about Sparefoot. Um, we're, we're basically like Hotels.com except for self-storage. So if you're looking for a storage unit, and you can search by size, amenity, location, and, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, we have all of our infrastructure in AWS today. Um, at one point, we had over 100 EC2 instances, which is not a, a huge amount, but we're, we're still a pretty small startup. Uh, and we have, it says 40 developers, we might have a few more now, uh, seven scrum teams. Uh, we're doing continuous delivery, so all the, all the developers can actually deploy to production whenever they want. So we ha have uh, HibChat for chat ops. We have a little bot we wrote, which basically will allow them to deploy and roll back to production at will. So it used to be I would deploy every day at three o'clock. And it was like, hey, is everyone ready? You know, go through the checklist. Who updated the ticket for deployments? It was just a real circus. And now anyone can do it. And the rule is if you break it, you fix it. So, and it actually has worked out really well. So uh, we've had Docker in production since 2014, um, but it was kind of a janky setup, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So how do we get into using Docker? Uh, basically, uh, we, had, we have hackathons every like three months, internal hackathons where the teams can just work on whatever they want. And apparently someone you know, saw a Docker on you know, Hacker News or whatever and said, hey, let's do this. And they actually uh, Dockerized uh, one of our services. And we didn't actually do anything with it at the time, but, but it kind of lit the fire like, hey, you know, this is actually something we could probably do. Um, so we started a two-person team, and they decided to rewrite the, the application we use for our call center. So when you call in, you can go to sparefoot.com and search, but we also have phone numbers, and you, you dial those phone numbers, and you know someone actually answers the phone, and there's an agent there with a web application that's similar to Sparefoot.com but slightly different, and they these two guys rewrote it, Node and, and React, and uh, they said, hey, we want to do this in Docker. I'm like, 
Okay, so uh, we pushed it out there and it just blew up. So uh, these guys were used developing locally on their machines and uh, we were building the Docker images with bamboo and we would just kind of had these real weird deploy mechanism where we would like rsync a bunch of code and then pull down a container which would mount a host volume and do a bunch of weird things. It was definitely not you know, like immutable artifacts. It was just really you know, all messed up. Um, we had some, some problems. Uh, it was really slow. Uh, we used to be able to build you know, our, our apps you know, in just like a minute. And then suddenly it's taking minutes, like six, seven minutes, until these, these developers are like, oh my God, six or seven minutes to build an app? What's, what's going on here, you know? So we told them to just go get a coffee or whatever, play ping pong, but uh, you know, it was, it was causing a lot of angst. Um, it was a little fragile. Uh, we had these, we would generate shell scripts at deploy time to start these containers and, and kill off the old ones. And it, it was just, it was a lot of maintenance because we were trying to homebrew everything. It was not a good idea. So we felt like Docker was a solution, but not the solution. Um, we were running our own Docker registry. So we were just running the Docker registry locally on an EC2 server. And probably once a week or every week and a half, it would just like exit. So, <laughs> so the builds would start failing, like, oh, the registry's dead, or, or we're doing pushes and it just hangs. So it was a pain. Um, we also had these, uh, these custom start scripts where we were passing all the, the arguments for starting the containers, like what host volumes are we gonna mount? What ports are we gonna forward? And it was all um, not really part of the, the source code. And so it was a pain to manage. So uh, we started off with, you know, we had an ELB and we had these two servers uh, running this application um, as a node app, you know, just listening on port 4, 000, or 3000 and we, put it in a Docker container and said, hey, we did it, you know, we nailed it. But in reality, it was just, uh, it, it's not the way we should have done it. Um, like Karthik said, we were kind of on the, the left-hand side of the curve in terms of adopting Docker. We had no idea what we were doing. So um, just to kind of speed things up, we said this doesn't work, stability is off, you know, we, we're, we don't want to do this anymore. We pulled it out of Docker, put it right back into the old deploy method where we would R sync code and then just you know run Apache. So uh, we knew that we didn't have any idea how to deploy these apps, and we knew that the Docker registry we were running was bad. And uh, we also had a problem that when we, with our old methods of deploying apps and services, we could deploy and we were using rsync, and if something was bad, we would, we would actually just rsync to the previous directory. We always had like a last 01, a last 02, and that worked well, but with Docker, there was no quick and easy way for us to do rollbacks. So when someone broke something, we, we would end up with you know, a short outage or downtime and that didn't make people happy either. So, um, all right, so some time passes and like everyone else, you know, we started to deconstruct the monolith and uh, I think I saw this, this meme downstairs from the American Airlines guy. There's several of them that are gonna be repeated here. Um, so as we started uh, creating these microservices and uh, I wasn't, part of this, we have a whole services team that does this, but it became clear that you know, these, these tiny services were you know, really good candidates for, you know, for Docker. So uh, we started creating you know, like API gateways, microservices, we had a data tier, and then we still had some of these customer facing applications. And you know, from what we were reading, we're like, yeah, you know, maybe we need to try the Docker thing again. So uh, the first thing was we knew that uh, running, our, running our own Docker registry was just a horrible idea. Uh, we didn't have a way to control access to it and maintaining it was uh, a pain. So we tried a, a product called Quay. Uh, Quay.io, um, basically it's just like a hosted Docker registry. And it, it does allow you to have fine-grained access control. You can set up teams and define who can push, who can read, you know, things like that. It has robots so that we can have uh, Bamboo and Vagrant have, you know, different permissions to do things. And it was actually pretty good. We, we kind of bolted it onto our CI process for our local builds and then our dev and our staging deploys. And it was, it was better than what we had before, simply because we removed some of the pain, but we didn't remove all the pain and we weren't quite willing to push that out to production. So this is just kind of a illustration of the, the workflow, the process. We would do the builds, push to dev, push to staging. And then you notice, oh, we're gonna go to production, we'll drop all the Docker stuff, we're gonna go do it the old way because it's safe. And, you know, it makes us feel good. 
So we decided that if we want to take that last jump, we needed to have orchestration. You know, how do we deploy these things? How do we do rollbacks better? And also, uh, we have things to hide. So secrets, like access tokens, passwords, all that kind of stuff, configuration. How do we do that in a Docker world? So um, we decided that we were going to do a beauty pageant of several different like Docker orchestration platforms. Stack Engine, which is a local Austin company. Um, Tutum or Tutum, um, which is now Docker Cloud. Um, we looked at Mesosphere, we looked at Kubernetes, we looked at Rancher. So we did, we did a whole bunch of you know, little trials and, and this was actually 2015, so some of the things I'm gonna say don't apply now, but in the end, well, at the time, like Stack Engine, some of the, uh, the products lacked things we needed, like Docker Compose support. Uh, Kubernetes was really cool, but I felt like I needed a PhD to understand how it works. Um, Mesosphere was good in concept, but it took forever to deploy apps. Then, of course, Amazon's uh, ECS, it, at the time, it lacked Docker Compose support as well, and we couldn't use custom AMIs for our, our builds. So um, in the end, it came down to Tutum and Rancher, and we, we did like kind of uh, trials for both of those, and in the end, uh, we chose Rancher. And primarily, it had more mature support for Docker Compose files. Um, Tutum, of course, added that later. And we are, we are able to orchestrate the deployments entirely through our own infrastructure. We didn't have to go through Tutum's like, you know, endpoint to do the deploys. So with Tutum you, or Docker Cloud, you can use your own hardware, uh, but you're still you're orchestrating the deployments through their service. And we felt that was maybe something we didn't want to do. So we got onto the, uh, the beta program with Rancher, and it worked out pretty well. We were able to set things up. Deployments were a breeze. I mean, it was, an, it was crazy how easy it was to set up. And we had all these containers running. We started off with like five, maybe 10 services we put in Docker. All the rest were still outside. And we kind of ran a trial for at least like two days. And then <laughs> my boss was like, yeah, this is great. Let's put everything in Docker. You know, so after two days, we said, it's great. <laughs> and, uh, and you notice that we're still using the, the ELBs in Amazon. And then inside the stacks, we would have our services. And every service would have an HA proxy. And we'd spread those HA proxies across each of the, the hosts within that scheduling group. And the importance of that additional, because ELBs are really HA proxies in Amazon. And so why are we adding another HA proxy you know, in this whole path? The reason is that we can um, quickly do rollbacks. So through the Docker Compose syntax, you can change the link. The HA proxy links to a service. And if something, if we do a deployment and something goes belly up, we can just quickly do a rollback where it's basically running Docker Compose on an alternate file, which puts the HA proxy link back to the previous service, which is still running, the, same, the old container is still running. So if something breaks, we can roll back in you know, less than two seconds. So that was pretty appealing. Um, that's the same thing. So we have, uh, this is kind of showing two different versions, and we do a, a deployment, it adds a third version, it's gonna remove the oldest version and, and leave you with two versions. And oops, something goes wrong with that, that new version we just deployed, and you just roll back. And like I said, it's, I mean, from the time we, we initiate rollbacks through HipChat, just you know, bang rollback and the application name, and it'll just execute that Docker compose on our rollback file. I mean, it's like two seconds, and we're back in business. So um, I want to quickly jump into secret management. Uh, we've been using SaltStack to manage our our infrastructure and our, the states of all of our, our servers for, for a long time. And we use uh, salt grains and salt filler to hold, hold secrets. So we have an, another weird convoluted system where um, we had some PHP libraries that would you know, pull the grains and the pillar data and then serve it out through a library. And we wanted to use this to populate these Docker Compose files you know, when we wanted to do the deployments to the different environments, dev, stage, prod. And we can do this by using uh, Jinja templating. So basically, uh, Docker Compose doesn't support Jinja you know, by default, but we, would, we added a step in between where we would check in the Compose files into the source repo for the service. And as a, a pre-deploy step, we would just render them you know, using a, a salt command to you know, render it based on the pillars and the grains information and it would just you know, inflate everything. This is probably hard.
hard to see, but you know, passwords, databases, hosts, I mean, all kinds of stuff um, we inject into the compose files at deploy time, uh, whether it's dev stage or prod. And this allowed us to check in a single compose file, and it supports local, dev, stage, and prod environments. So it was, it was really cool. And I, I, I show some conditionals in here, like you know, if the environment is dev or if it's stage, and I've evolved it since then because Jinja also has a, a formatting template where you can inject a variable into, it's almost like, like when you're writing C code, you can do percent %s and things like that. You're injecting the environment into it. So you only have one block, not you know, a whole bunch of conditionals. So it's even better than this now. Uh, let's see, we're doing pretty good on time. Um, so what happens when we do the Rancher Compose? This, uh, this is a bit of Python code that I wrote. It's basically using the, the salt client to call git template, which is gonna take a file from uh, our, our salt repository and render it. And it renders it, it'll inject the grains, the salt filler stuff. I don't know, does anyone here use uh, salt stack? Okay, so there's a, a small number of you. It's really cool, but I don't wanna spend much time talking about salt. but it, It'll allow us to inject all this stuff into here. And originally, I, in our early prototypes, I would have a Docker Compose directory for each environment. And uh, you know, I was told this is too hard to maintain because you know, if you want to edit one file, if you forget to edit the other file, now you have inconsistencies between environments, and, and it's true. So um, this Jinja templating turned out to be a really cool thing. So, uh, and like I said, we were in the beta of Rancher at the time. And after I spent all this time implementing this, Rancher turned around and added uh, variable interpolation into you know, their product directly. So you can actually use regular environment variables and those can get injected into the compose files. So um, we did not throw away what we did because we already had the secrets in salt stacks and the pillars and in the grains. And we would have had to export those into environment variables just to get into the compose files anyway. So we decided to just leave it the way it is and uh, we kind of shared with Rancher what we did, and they said, hey, that's a novel idea. And uh, you know, it was like the next release, they added something similar, so <laughs> that's just the way it goes. All right, so we, uh, I don't remember what this slide is about, but we deployed our first microservice, and everything worked. And uh, like I mentioned, we had like five or five to 10 services uh, and they were the, not the customer facing apps, they were just you know, back-end services like, a, like inventory search or review service, things like that, and uh, A-B testing framework. Everything was working cool, and uh, we started putting more and more onto the Rancher environment. We had all these containers going, we thought we were doing awesome, and then all of a sudden, it just broke. <laughs> and, and we were entirely you know, novices with, with Docker and Rancher, we weren't sure what was going on, and uh, what it turns out, it was it didn't cause a production outage, which was kind of the, the key thing here that I want to emphasize. So we had all these, these services pushed out there, and uh, Rancher just blew up. I mean, the admin server for Rancher, you couldn't access it. You go, to, it actually runs in a container itself. You go into the container, and I get Rancher is like a Java app natively, and, and I, I hate Java. And it just is spewing a stack trace of like nonstop Java stack trace, just going forever in the Docker logs. And we couldn't figure out what was going on. We couldn't get it to, to, to resolve itself, kill the container, restart the container, and then it's like corrupt and all sorts of bad things are happening. And we learned some lessons there. Um, the first one, and most importantly, is that uh, Rancher is smart enough that if, if the control point, so the orchestration point dies and goes away, it doesn't matter. Everything works. And th that's what was most critical to us because you know, we had all these services out there in production. We were using them. And we couldn't take an outage. So Rancher blew up, and it was okay. Uh, the second one was that after we, we talked with uh, the Rancher folks, and they said, well, uh, what does your database look like? I'm like, I don't know, the database is in your container, it's all messed up. They're like, oh, yeah, we shouldn't have done that. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, putting data in containers, and I know there's, there's different products out there now that are all about putting data into containers, but we decided we were just gonna punt on that whole concept, and. Uh, we no longer put any kind of data in containers. Uh, we'll run Redis containers if it's caching only, but anything that needs to persist, we're just like, nope, not gonna do that. So 
And then going forward from that point on, uh, we are using RDS as the uh, data store for the Rancher admin server itself. All right, so where are we today? Uh, we now have 52 uh, apps and microservices in production with uh, Rancher and Docker. Um, each of those apps, not, not each of them, but many of those apps do between five and 10 deployments per day of each of those services. Uh, the busiest of these, we're getting maybe like 50 requests per second. And we also have uh, the customer facing things. So if you go to selfstorage.com or sparefoot.com, uh, those PHP uh, Falcon apps are actually containerized as well. So there's very little at Sparefoot that is not in containers, maybe 5%. We have some legacy like SOAP APIs that uh, no one wants to touch. And we still have a couple partners still using it. So that, that's outside of the, the Docker scope for now. And uh, we had an old a lunch app where within our, our hip chat, we had a bot and you just do ban lunch and it, it tells you what lunch is today because Sparefoot feeds us every day, which is nice. So, um, so we're continuing to uh, evolve in our, our Docker ways. We, we think we know what we're doing, but you know, I've given a similar talk uh, several times. I, I spoke at Container Days in New York City last, just in October, and I thought we knew what we were doing then, and, and we've, we've changed a lot since then as well. And I think I spoke at the, the Docker meetup locally here, and uh, that was pretty much this talk, so sorry if it's a duplicate of something you've heard before. But we continue to evolve and look at new ways to do things. Um, we have a team that's still looking at, you know, what can we do for data in containers. Uh, Rancher has a product called Convoy, and it's, I, I'm not real familiar with it because I haven't played with it. And it's pretty much a way you can use EBS volumes and then at containers start and stop, it like archives them to S3 and then pulls it back down. So it doesn't matter where your container deploys, you can still get that data that you need. Um, but I'm not sure how fast it would be using S3 as a backend. So, so we're still keeping data outside of Docker for now, but that may change. Okay, so um, just final words. Start small, like we did. Uh, we failed a lot. You know, we we learned some lessons. You know, don't run your own Docker registry. That's a bad idea. There's commercial products that are dirt cheap and they do a much better job. Um, and then just keep learning because there's lots of ways to do things. And if you ask me today, was would I run or would I start off and do everything in Rancher today? Probably, but maybe not. Um, there's there's been a lot of changes in the orchestration tools out there. Um, I might give Kubernetes another look now that I've had more experience with Docker and containers. Um, Docker Cloud, now that you know Docker has bought Tudum, um, that may also be you know another appealing thing. So I don't think it matters what the orchestration tools are that you're using. Just use something, and don't think you can just kind of hack it up and, and do it yourself to save a buck because it's generally a bad idea. So, and that is it. And I will take questions if you have them. Where did you find the joke about how you use containers to sell containers? <laughs> so, I need that, don't I? Yeah. So, Sparefoot does have a warehouse offering now. So, instead of traditional storage units, you can, um, it's like drop off storage or full service. They'll pick it up and just take all your stuff and hide it in a box inside of a warehouse. But if it were a actual shipping container, that would be pretty cool, right? Question way in the back. Oh, well, the question was how many man hours did it take uh, to get from the very beginning to where we are now? So if we exclude that first you know, foray into Docker when we had that call center app that just crashed and burned all the time, uh, when we started doing the services, you know, we did our little, the beauty pageant with the, like all the different software, and once we settled on Rancher, I mean, it was two or three days, and we had our dev and stage environments up with containers running, and you know, our, our VP of engineering was very you know, bullish on Docker, and he's like, yeah, let's just push everything to prod tonight. And so we were just very quickly moving things in. I mean, so realistically, we went from nothing in Docker to you know, five to 10 services in Docker you know, within a week, and all the rest of those like you know, 35 to 40 services and apps, it took longer to convert, um, but that's only because we had to get buy-in from the sprint teams. Um, the product owners had to 
you know, prioritize the work because they have to write all the Docker Compose files. They may have to change um, where they're getting some of their configuration from. Is it coming from files versus environment variables since all that pillar data is now injected into the containers as environment variables. So, um, but from our, our second start, I mean, realistically, we got most of the things in there within three months. And then there's stragglers that continue to you know, get dockerized and put into the system. Um, so we'll develop engineering as a whole is like 40 people. Um, our DevOps team at one point was four people. Um, in January, it got down to two, including myself. <laughs> We're back up to three now, and uh, uh, we may grow again yet before the summer is, is here. Oh, performance. Um, I should have put some performance slides in here, but we actually uh, have reduced. So we're using Pingdom to measure like uh, page load times and uh, like Pingdom, the Roam tool. And for barefoot.com and selfstorage.com, both of our, our products, um, page load times are at or under 2.0 seconds right now. And we never could do that before with the old setup. So. And we've also saved some cash just because we don't have 100 EC2 servers out there running all these different applications and whatnot. Um, with Docker, we have different scheduling groups. So, you know, consumer services are here. Some app group one is here. We have an A-B test framework here. Um, some call center apps run in this group. So uh, we still have, in our production environment, I think it's 24 servers running containers. So we used to have this big monolithic you know, library, and uh, they, they split it up for the most part. I have no idea how they did it. Luckily, I was not involved. So uh, it's a good question. I, I just don't know the answer to that one. So yeah, we've got just two minutes left. All right, so um, well, we're using Pingdom, but we're also using um, Product called like Telegraph, it's like StatsD, and we have InfluxDB behind that and Grafana in front of it, and all the applications are sending data. So as an application needs to talk to a backend service, it's you know pushing these UDP packets to Telegraph about how long did it take to get a response from the service, and we have you know dozens of charts and graphs for monitoring. Um, we're also pulling in uh, the Apache access logs off of our Syslog server from Logstash, and we're charting all that. So and you can see. Anytime we annotate deployments and builds, so anytime there's a deployment, you can actually see on a service by service basis, you know, is the, the mean in time increasing or decreasing after that. So you immediately know if a deployment is breaking something. Um, and they have a few other tools that, that we're using for monitoring. Um, it's just it's a whole suite of things. So I actually had a question too. Um, how do you deal with the, so Docker revs a lot, uh, and so they have like a newer version coming out every now and then. How do you kind of deal with that from a production and from a dev test standpoint? Right, so we were actually um, locked into a specific version of Rancher for a long time. Um, up until Rancher went GA, um, we were locked in at, at Docker 191. Uh, at one time we bumped up to 110, and uh, immediately things started not working right in the staging environments with cross-host networking and some other weird things. They advised us to switch back to 191 until they could fix some other bugs. And then recently we switched to 10, no, 1103, I think is what we're at now. So, so we kind of are using the Docker version that is supported by the orchestration tool. All right, and I think that's it. Awesome. There was a question on microservices, and I think that was a great uh, segue into the next talk that we'll do at 1055, which is all in microservices and stuff. So uh, re-ask that question to the next speaker.